Hello there, welcome to Explain International and today I'll be reviewing a debate that I recently did with someone who calls himself a Biblical Unitarian, um, Carlos Xavier. And what Biblical Unitarians uh, believe is that they believe that the Bible does not teach that Jesus is God and this is some sort of a later development in Christianity and I've been anticipating since the last video I made uh, looking forward to this particular interaction with Carlos Xavier. This is not my first interaction with him. This is actually my second debate with Carlos. But this time we decided to go beyond the first debate that is just talking about does the Bible teach Jesus is God. I think it's very clear that the Bible does teach that. But we wanted to discuss a topic called the two natures of Christ. And let me give a little bit of an introduction as to why that is important. Because when most of us claim that Jesus is God, we also acknowledge that Jesus is man. Which is why I pointed out in the last debate that I find it very interesting that the promotion by this group called Away uh, on the newspaper said Jesus is a man, not God. That's strange because if you're a Christian, you believe Jesus is a man. The Bible teaches there is one mediator between God and man, the man. Christ Jesus. So no Christian in their right frame of mind will deny the humanity of Jesus. In fact, the early Christian councils really battled, especially the Council of Chalcedon, was battling over the issue of Jesus' humanity against movements like Docetism, which kind of downplayed Jesus' full and true humanity. And so I'm looking forward to this because we believe that Jesus is God. We believe that Jesus is truly man. And yet, how does, uh, I mean, what does the Bible actually teach about these two natures of Jesus? You know, because far too often I've realized that we, you know, we essentially get troubled when we come across passages in scripture which teaches that Jesus does not know the hour of his return. That one has caused many Christians, including myself, in full honesty and transparency. I've struggled with that before I really started examining the topic of Jesus' deity, how can Jesus claim to be God and not know the hour of his return? Until, of course, you realize that the Bible teaches Jesus is man. And it's not just that he's appearing to be man, he really is human in every sense of that word. He is not, he doesn't inherit the sinful nature that Adam inherited. No, he's born sinless. And yet, he, 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 despite all of these things, he's truly man because what defines humanity is not our sinful nature. We need to be, make that clear. Adam was not born with a sinful nature and so, or created with a sinful nature for that matter. But the point of what I'm getting at here is this. We need to discuss how exactly Jesus is God and what exactly we mean when we say he is truly man. So. The topic of the two divine, uh, the, the two natures of Jesus really helps explore that. And I was looking forward, as I said, to this debate. And so what I'm going to do in this video is to summarize my opening statement, which I gave, and to briefly touch on the opening statement from Carlos, which, uh, in all honesty, was a big disappointment. And you'll, you'll see why in just a minute. But I really want to spend a bit of time because this debate was unique in terms of its format. It's the first time that we kind of lumped rebuttal and cross-examination together. So typically in debates, you would have a period allocated for rebuttal and a period allocated for cross-examination where you respond to what the other side has said in their opening statement. And then you get to ask questions in your cross-examinations to the other speaker and vice versa. This debate, uh, Carlos insisted on lumping uh, or, or rather suggested that we, we lump these two things together in one time frame. And so uh, if you watch the debate, you will see that it's kind of mixed together and you really need to pay attention to know when the cross-examination is starting and when the rebuttal is going on. So in that sense, a little bit messy, but I'm fine with the format uh, as long as I have a great opportunity to be able to present a biblical case as to why Jesus is truly God and truly man. So with that said, I'm going to explore the opening statements. I'm going to explore the rebuttal cross-examination and I want to briefly touch on my own summary of the debate, what I took away from it. And all this to, to not to, to say this, you need to watch the debate for yourself. I'm simply putting this out there to help people uh, sense what was going through my mind uh, when I was approaching this debate. And maybe that may have you help you as you process what some of the things that transpired 
through this debate. So let me first of all summarize my opening statement. Uh, in this debate, as I said, the title of the debate is Did Jesus Have Two Natures? And I, I placed importance on framing the opening statement to these two questions. First question, can God become flesh? And I specifically chose that language because that's the language that scripture uses in John chapter 1 verse 14. Can God become flesh? Now, you would think it's a straightforward answer, yes, but you'd be surprised how many people actually push back on that. And, and they say, God can't do that. Mind you, many of the people who push back, not all, but many of those who push back actually claim that God is omnipotent, uh, all-powerful, that he can do whatever that is logically possible. And yet they will deny that God cannot voluntarily, of his own free will, choose to enter into his creation as man. They, they will deny that. How do you reconcile those two things together? You, you've got to ask them. But the point is, this was the way I framed the debate, can God become man? And as you go to the end of the debate, that's still the question through which I want our viewers to be able to look at this because if your view is this, that God cannot be, quote, born in the likeness of men, which is what Philippians 2, 7 describes of Jesus, or God cannot, quote, uh, you know, be sent in the likeness of sinful flesh, end quote, Romans 8, verse 3, then obviously this whole question is, uh, the, the debate is over. God can't become man. And, and, and when you maintain that, you've got to also eliminate your position about God being all-powerful. That's just not logically possible with this because for God to enter his own creation is not asking the logically impossible. So with that said, uh, the first question is, can God become flesh? And, and throughout the debate, we, we didn't really get a chance to see Carlos interacting with that. He seems to be saying no to that, but he didn't clearly put that out. But the second question is also an important one. It's a follow up to the first. It's the frame from which you're supposed to look at this entire debate. And that is, if God can become man, which by the way, I, I say that God can because scripture not only says he can, but that he did. How will that look like? Will that look like him losing his deity so that he is no longer God in order to embrace humanity? Or, or would that look like that he sort of mixes his humanity and his deity together so that he becomes sort of a demigod, a half God, half man kind of thing? Or does it mean that he would assume full humanity while retaining his deity? Because deity is not something that can be lost, right? You're either God or you're not God. Right, so that, that's, that's just it. So uh, now obviously I, I take the third position that Christ, and which is the biblical position, that Christ assumed a true full humanity while retaining his deity. Of course the kenotic heresy uh, that is often taken from, uh, wrongly taken from Philippians chapter two insists that you know, Jesus lost his deity in embracing humanity. That's not what the scripture teaches at all. Uh, and of course, uh, you go into the early church debates on this issue, some people actually felt that Jesus was, uh, had one nature. And what that means is, if Jesus has only one nature, he, you end up with Jesus who is a half God, half man, because you see that one nature has now got to be divided into these two parts. And so it's sort of a mixing of humanity and deity together in one nature. And uh, again, I would argue that scripture does not teach that. But the point of this debate is to emphasize that Christ had two natures, and I'm going to define what nature means in just a bit. The two natures of Christ means that Christ is truly divine because he possesses a divine nature and human because he possesses a human nature. And all that comes within this framework of these two questions. Number one, can God become flesh? And number two, if so, since so, that's what the scripture teaches, how would that look like? So I only had one argument main argument for this debate and that came in four premises. Now before I got to that, uh, in my opening statement I took time to define what uh, three important terms that were essential to this debate and uh, it was nice to see that Carlos appreciated that I'd taken time to define this. So uh, the first of these three words is the word nature. Now what we mean by nature is we're talking about what an object is 
what is the nature of a bottle? It, what that, that would depend. You're going to explain what a bottle is and at what point does a bottle cease becoming a bottle? You know, those kind of things. What's the nature of water? And you know, you, you, you go on from there. So a nature essentially or nature is what an object is. Now this comes from the Greek word ousia, which is in the New Testament, but interestingly never applied uh, directly to the person of Jesus. It's typically applied to uh, material things. And um, maybe in a later video, we can look at that. Now in the Latin, we get the word essentia or substantia, which is uh, where we get the English word essence or substance. This is what we're talking about when we talk about nature. The second word that needs to be defined uh, is the word divine nature, which would seem to be just nature with divine. And you're, you're, you're right if you assume that. It simply means what God is in his one undivided essence, which we refer to as God's attributes. Now, the final term we need to define is human nature. And by human nature, of course, I meant what constitutes a human being, namely a body soul composite with corresponding capacities such as a will, mind and emotions um, and so forth. So when we say that Jesus has a human nature, that's uh, now, we're not going to get into this video into the early Christological debates that were taking place. But you know, you have a debate uh, between the those from Antioch and those from Alexandria that were really debating about what we mean by the incarnation that that is God taking on flesh the language that we find in John chapter 1 verse 14 the word became flesh what does that look like does it mean that the divine mind the person of Jesus who is a mind in that understanding just takes on a human body is that what it is or does he take on a human body and soul in which case He's not just a word with a flesh, he is a man. I mean, this you're talking about the man, Jesus Christ, who really is man. He's not just a human, a divine mind in a human body. Now, those who one of the prominent uh, heresies that, that took the view that Jesus is a divine again, again, this is an oversimplification, but divine mind in human body would be Apollinarianism. Uh, and that, that's that's a position that was declared heresy in the early church and so you, you get the idea why it's important to be careful exactly what we mean because two reasons as Joel Burke uh, the theo uh, Puritan theologian puts this the gospel and glory gospel in the sense that the gospel hinges upon the identity of who we say Jesus is you would remember the question Jesus says who do you say that I am and this I always point out that how we answer that question determines where you and I will spend the rest of eternity, whether in heaven for giving to God what belongs to God or hell for denying the Lord what belongs to him or, you know, vice versa. If Jesus is not God and you claim he's God, you've committed blasphemy and the opponents of Jesus, that's, that's the exact charge that they brought against him. So this is an important question because the gospel hinges on it. But it's also important because God's glory is found in the person of Jesus Christ. In, in the Old Testament, the Bible says that God says to Moses you know, that he's going to perform these great signs and wonders that Egypt, that the people of Israel in Egypt will know that I am the Lord. And you find similar language in the New Testament where after Jesus performs the signs and wonders, the recognition is that Jesus is Lord. And so you see that in the healing of the blind man in John's gospel, you know, so you, when you put these things together, you realize that we're talking about the glory of God here. And you're talking about the heart of the gospel itself, what that means. So this, even though we're going to get into some, some issues that really need defining, it's important to think through these things because they affect the heart of the gospel and the glory of God is revealed in scripture. So in my opening statement, my only argument was that Jesus possesses two natures, I broke it down into a series of premises. The first premise is that God possesses a divine nature. Now, all through the debate, I, this, 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 there doesn't, didn't appear to be any challenge from Carlos' side to, to dispute this point. Um, Carlos simply seems to have just ignored it or conceded it. I'm not sure. Right, so, but the scripture is clear that God has a divine nature. Romans 1.20 tells us 
that his eternal power and divine nature have been clearly perceived so if god doesn't have a divine nature how do we perceive right so you get to second peter 1 verse 4 that tells us so that through them you may become partakers of the divine nature how do you and i creatures partake of the divine nature now that's an interesting thought isn't it we don't partake in the divine nature by becoming god we partake in the divine nature by being in christ who is god and that's that's the key of all of this now i don't want to get ahead of myself so far first premise the bible teaches well uh, the bible teaches that god possesses a divine nature number two should also be not controversial humans possess a human nature that that's, it just goes without saying and i'm these two premises are important because i'm going to build on these two things to talk about what the bible teaches concerning jesus christ now the bible does teach that human beings have a human nature you know for example in psalm chapter 8 verse 4 to 5 the, the psalmist asks, what is man that you're mindful of him and the son of man that you care for him you have yet you have made him a little lower than the heavenly beings and crowned him with glory and honor so that means to be human is to be a little lower than the heavenly beings so that's one of those attributes i guess you could say or characteristics that defines what it is to be human now following from that we went to our third premise and this is the one that is going to be strongly challenged although um, in all fairness i i don't i didn't see a, a strong challenge posed against this third premise in the entirety of the debate because the focus was really on the two natures not on the deity of christ but premise three jesus is truly god now i intended to sustain this my approach in this debate was to just go with the clear-cut statements because this is not one of those debates where you make a clear uh, you know, genesis to revelation kind of an argument for jesus's deity i had already done that in the previous debate with carlos xavier so for this one i was just going to go with the basic text that just outright says jesus is god and if carlos wanted to dispute that uh, well we could get into the greek grammar as i did in the first debate so john chapter 20 was 28 thomas answered him my lord and my god it's important to realize that thomas answered him and that that third person pronoun there, singular pronoun, him, refers to Jesus Christ. So it's not Thomas just saying, wow, my God, that, that's, not what, that's not how people speak in biblical times. It's Thomas speaking to Jesus, saying, my Lord and my God, God of me, Lord of me. So Lord of me and God of me. Now, Titus 2.13 says that it calls says waiting for our blessed hope the appearing of the glory of our great god and savior jesus christ so jesus is called our great god and savior jesus christ now some people intend to dispute this they would say that well the the, the language should be changed you know it should be our great god comma and savior jesus christ as if you're talking about two distinct persons uh, i may do a video one day on the granville sharp rule which is a rule in biblical greek grammar a grammar greek grammar that would say that in these circumstances both of these uh, great god and savior apply to the same person jesus christ the same principle is true in second peter 1 1 where simon peter calls jesus quote our god and savior jesus christ uh, end quote. So that's something that Peter is going to repeat in 2 Peter 1.11 where he says our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. Interestingly those who uh, claim that God and Savior cannot both be applied to Jesus here have no problem saying that in verse 11 of the same chapter Lord and Savior both apply to Jesus Christ. They have no problem saying that. The syntax is the same. What's the difference? If Lord is used for Jesus, they will say, oh, that's fine. But you cannot use the word God for Jesus. That's inconsistency. And I pointed that out, that out in my last debate with uh, Carlos Xavier. Now, the third one is uh, another simple one. It's from Jude uh, verse 5. Jude has no chapters. He says, quote, now I want to remind you, although you once fully knew it, that Jesus, who saved a people out of the land of Egypt, afterward destroyed those who did not believe. So who saved the people out of Egypt? Jesus did. So according to the Old Testament, who saved the people out of Egypt? God did, the Lord, Yahweh. 
Well, text indicates that Jesus is Yahweh. I mean, it's as simple as that. Now, the, one of the common objections you will get when you use this one is that, wait, not all the Bible translations have the word Jesus. Uh, they use the word Lord, you know, and which is very interesting because they ignore the fact that verse 4 um, talks about denying our only Lord and Master Jesus Christ. They ignore the context, that's okay. The entire context is talking about Jesus. But the point here is that the earliest and the most reliable manuscripts actually go with um, Jesus who saved the people out of the land of Egypt. And so if they want to talk about the earliest manuscripts, what it says, we can go there. Now, is there a reason why some, some versions use the word Lord? Well, there are mul multiple explanations why some manuscripts go with the word Lord, and one of it could be that it's just referring to the sacred name, uh, which is Jesus. You know, just like people in the Old Testament would not use the word, it would not pronounce Yahweh whenever it was there, and just use the word Adonai, which is Lord, to, to avoid saying the sacred name, uh, that practice applied in the New Testament. Now that's one argument. There are plenty of other reasons, factors for that. So that in Deuteronomy chapter 6 verse 4, Hear, O Israel, the Lord our God, the Lord is one. Uh, Shema Yisrael, Yahweh Elohinu, Yahweh Echad. The Jewish people sometimes would just read it as Shema Yisrael Adonai, Elohinu, Adonai Echad, where the word Adonai is used in the place of Yahweh to avoid saying the sacred name. So that could be one reason it's there. But regardless, the earliest and most reliable manuscripts have it as Jesus. And that's enough, sufficient for this argument to stand. Um, so, but apart from that, we've got Philippians chapter 2, verse 5 to 8 that says, Have this mind among yourselves, which is yours in Christ Jesus, who, though he was in the form of God, did not count equality with God a thing to be grasped, but emptied himself by taking the form of a servant, being born in the likeness of men, and being found in human form, he humbled himself by becoming obedient to the point of death, even death on a cross. Now, I want you to keep this in mind because people, some of these people that deny the deity of Christ believe that Jesus was just born a man. He, he did not have pre-existence. But the point is this, Philippians 2 is about Christian submission. And you've got a order right here. And in this order, one, there's a, there's a logical order, and a, you may argue even a chronological order to some degree. But the point is this, the mind that the Christian is supposed to have is supposed to be the same mind that Jesus had, who, though he was in the form of God, did not count equality with God, a thing to be grasped. Now, when did Jesus think, or when did Jesus choose not to let equality with God be something that he clings on to? When did that take place? Before he was born. How do you say that? Because the expression of the text is that he, Jesus expressed his, you know, not counting equality with God a thing to be grasped by taking the form of a servant and being born in the likeness of men. So being born is Jesus expressing that he does not want to count equality with God something to be grasped, which means that Jesus is not only pre-existent before he is born, he's already humbling himself to the Father, but how can this be a form of humility if Jesus is not equal to God? I mean, you can't say you're very humble if you worship God, can you? I can't say I'm humble if I worship God. Oh, I'm so humble. You imitate me being humble as I bow down to God and consider God greater than me. You'd be like, Sam, it's, it's, it's right. You, you, you're a creature. How dare you say that you're considering yourself humble uh, by being equal to God? Well, the fact is that, that Jesus is, has to be equal to God in order for him to do that. He has to be equal to God. You know, for him to be able to say that and for the text to be able to say that this is the is the humility, humility that he's taking in, in not counting equality with God a thing to be grasped. Now, some people are going to butcher this by going to Genesis and saying, well, Adam was created in the image of God. No, Adam was never equal to God. Don't ever let anyone twist such passages away. They will take a clear passage like this, which plainly at face value teaches Jesus is equal to God and they will twist it in the name of context and say, well, uh, if you've got to go through the context and what they mean by context is eventually you've got to read the passage exact opposite of what it plainly states. 
And often they won't even rely on this book. They will go to a different book, a different language. Uh, you know, we've, we've, <laughs> in the ministry, we've seen this so many times take place. And so as a believer, if you're watching this, stay on guard, stay on the text itself. The context will not change the plain meaning of the text. It's plainly there that Jesus is God. That's what the scripture teaches. And good luck for those who are going to try to take this and twist it to say, well, that, that just simply means that Jesus recognized he was man. The text says nothing of that sort. Now, so I want to move on right here to, to, to talk about the uh, fourth premise, and that is that Jesus is truly human. Now, in my in the debate, I would have thought that this is a plain, something that is just plain, it's not controversial, but you would be surprised. Uh, in the cross-examination, I repeatedly tried to ask Carlos Xavier to, 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 to agree with me that at least Jesus possessed a human nature, and uh, you would see that the moderator had to step in at one point, uh, because he just wouldn't do that. I'm not sure why that is, but maybe he had a good reason for it. Uh, but that's, that's, that was just that. So, in fact, the Bible clearly teaches that Jesus is truly human. As we quoted 1 Timothy 2.5 earlier, Hebrews 2.14 says, Since therefore children share in flesh and blood, he himself likewise partook of the same things. That through death he might destroy the one who has the power of death, that is, the devil. 2 John 1.7, For many deceivers have gone out into the world, those who do not confess the coming of Jesus Christ in the flesh. Such a one is the deceiver and the antichrist. What's strange is this, that it seems that the scripture warns us about the danger, especially in 2 John 1, 7, or 1 verse 7, of people who deny that Jesus comes, came in the flesh. Now, why would that be if Jesus is just a man? You don't have anyone denying that Moses came in the flesh. You don't have anyone who denies that David came in the flesh. You don't have anyone who denied that Mo Isaiah, Elijah came in the flesh. Then why, what's so unique about Jesus? That it's, it's imperative to remind Christians that Jesus came in the flesh. And I will submit to you that it's because Jesus is God incarnate. As John 1.1 1, 1 clearly place, states it. That the scripture needs to emphasize not just that Jesus is man, and that the word is uh, the, not just that Jesus is God, but that the word became flesh. That's key. He didn't just remain as God; he took on flesh. And so, at the end of this, as we look at the four premises: number one, Jesus possesses a divine nature; number two, Jesus possesses a human nature; number three, Jesus is truly God; number four. Jesus is truly human. When you put all of those things together, you end up with the, con with this, the conclusion that therefore Jesus does indeed possess two natures. And that was basically the argument that I put forward in the debate. Of course, I ended it by pointing at, uh, I'm not sure if I did this in the opening statement, but my intention was to go to Hebrews 1 verse 3 and Colossians 2 9, which is the two biblical texts that I think summarize this whole thing. Hebrews 1 verse 3 tells us that he, that is Jesus, is the radiance of the glory of God and the exact imprint of his nature, of God's whatever characteristics of that, that God has. Jesus is the exact imprint of that. Now, no mere creature can ever say this about Jesus. No mere creature, about, about themselves, no mere creature can ever say that I am the exact imprint of the divine nature. And Jesus would himself says, I can do whatever God does. Now we know that there are some weird preachers out there. I recently saw a clip uh, by Jesse Duplantis uh, that claimed that, you know, that something to the effect that, you know, he, God created us to be able to do things like him. Uh, well, that, that's not true at all. <laughs> so the fact is God is creator. We are creature, but not Jesus Christ. He is creator. He shares in God's creative uh, work in all of creation. So that's right there. And not only that, the text tells us in Hebrews 1, 3, and he, that is Jesus, upholds the universe by the word of his power. So when Jesus is there being struck on the cheek and hanging on the cross with his hands nailed to that wooden beam, he still upheld the universe by the word of his power. And imagine what a thought that is, that the God of this world who created 
the creator of this world, that is the, the Lord who created everything, the sun, moon and stars, upholding even the smallest atoms in the most distant planet, in the most distant galaxies. He was doing all of that while being struck as man and doing all of these things. And you begin to realize how profound and mysterious and glorious and majestic it is that the incarnation of God taking on flesh, he's able to do that. We're talking about Jesus here who is upholding the universe, not just earth, not just a galaxy, but all of it, the created order by the word of his power. And after making purifications for sins, he sat down at the right hand of the majesty on high. The scripture has a high view of Christ. And it's not just a high view, it's the highest possible view that you can have. Colossians 2.9 says, and this was going to be the text that I use all throughout the debate, pushing home this point, in him, key phrase, him refers to the person of Jesus. In Jesus, the fullness of deity. What, what, what do you mean by that? The divine nature, all of what it means, the sum total of what it means to be God. In him, the whole fullness of deity dwells, but it doesn't just stop there, dwells bodily. Now, body implies a human nature. I tried to get Carlos in the end of the cross-examination to at least acknowledge that body implies a human nature. Again, for some reason, he refused to answer the most simplest questions. But when the text says bodily, we're talking about the human nature here. So in the person of Jesus Christ, all the fullness, the sum total of what it means, the fullness of deity, what it means to be God, dwells in his body, bodily. You've got the two natures right there, explicit teaching of Jesus. Now, of course, Carlos is going to try and reinterpret this by jumping to Ephesians and 1 Corinthians, uh, which, as you will see, in we're going to show some of those clips in just a minute, but you, you will see that he, he does a really bad job and more than anything else, uh, he fails to understand the communication of the attributes, which is uh, we, in, in Latin, uh, communicatio idiomatum, which that is to say, what is true of each nature, whether it's his human nature or his divine nature, is true of the one person that Jesus, the Word, united himself with a complete humanity. And the complete humanity we're speaking about here is not just a human body. That's a mistake that some people made when they think that Jesus is just a divine mind in a human body. No, no, no. Jesus is a human I mean, Jesus is God taking on a complete humanity that includes both the soul and the body. And that's going to be important. So, And, and in, this, uh, in this debate, you would see me uh, pointing to some of the early church fathers, such as Ignatius and Tertullian. And now, Carlos, again, I'm not sure whether he, he believes this or he's just saying this. I've seen him say this elsewhere that I'm doing this because I'm relying on the early church fathers, That's, that could not be further from the truth. Everything that I'm taking here is directly from the scriptures itself. However, I recognize that God has sent teachers to the church and sometimes they help us phrase these things better than we can. You know, We learn things at school from our teachers. Thank God for teachers. And so I think it's helpful to go to the early church fathers to see how they, 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 they phrase some of these things uh, and especially as some of these early church fathers like Ignatius of Antioch that has connections all the way up to the God to, to John the Apostle. So this is and again the other point that I wanted to do this for is to establish that this is not a late development and you'll see Carlos mentioning this in the debate that oh you know this is some late development centuries after Christianity, uh, Jesus and the, uh, the apostles, that's not true. Uh, Ignatius is saying, quote, from Mary and from God, first passable and then impassable, Jesus Christ our Lord, end quote. This is his letter to the Ephesians. By the way, Ignatius was on his way to being martyred. And what in, in the midst of his martyrdom, not thinking about his own life, he thinks and reflects upon doctrine who the person of Jesus Christ is. Why gospel and glory? The gospel, central to the message of the gospel is the identity of Jesus Christ. Central to the gospel is also the glory of God, which is the revelation of God in flesh. 
the radiance of God's glory in Jesus Christ. And so Ignatius, as he's thinking, is not affected by late uh, Greek mythology and all that. No, no, he's not de de detached from the culture that, you know, he's just 21st century reading this up and coming to these conclusions. No, this is someone who possibly knew the Apostle John himself and is coming up with this and saying about these two natures from Mary and from God. First passable, then impassable, Jesus Christ, our Lord, the one person with two divine natures uh, and not just these two divine natures but these two these two natures communicating to the person whatever the attribute is so what is the attributes of god omniscience omnipresence omnipotence that is communicated to the person so much so that jesus is able to say whatever the father can do i too can do that's that's the divine nature communicated to the person and on the other hand, you've got the human nature being born of the Virgin Mary, being, you know, suffering hunger like we do, um, you know, needing to eat, feeling lethargy, tiredness, pain, able to die, mortality, all that communicated to the person of Jesus Christ. So that if you ask Ignatius, is Jesus from Mary, the person Jesus from Mary or from God, Ignatius says both. He's from Mary and he's from God. And before you jump and say it's contradiction, it's not in the same sense because he has two divine natures which communicate these attributes or these properties to him perfectly. So that's that's what the early church fathers taught and Tertullian echoes that in, uh, in, his, in his writing against Martian, an early church heretic uh, in, at the end of the first century. Sorry, at the end of the second century century he says quote thus the nature of the two substances displayed him as man and god in one respect born in the other unborn in one respect fleshly in the other spiritual in one sense weak in the other exceedingly strong in one sense dying in the other sense living and so what did these early church fathers who were living under roman persecution think about what they thought about was who the person of Jesus Christ is. What were they influenced with? The scriptures. They were taking passages like Colossians 2.9. For in him, the fullness of deity dwells in bodily form. And when you, when you begin to examine that, you, you begin to see who this person Jesus truly is and the mystery of the incarnation becomes clearer and clearer. In, in, in the fifth uh, century, uh, you've got Leo uh, called, Leo, you know, Leo, in his famous Leo's tome, his epistle to Flavian says, quote, as God does not change by his condescension, so man is not swallowed up by being exalted. Each nature exercises its own activity in communion with the other. The word does what is proper to the word. The flesh fulfills what is proper to the flesh. He is God, he says later on down, he is God in virtue of the fact, quote, in the beginning was the word, the word and the word was with God and the word was God, end quote. He is man in the virtue of the fact that, quote, the word was made flesh and dwelt with us, end quote. Notice what was Leo influenced by? Was he influenced purely by Greek philosophy? No, he was influenced by the writings, the explicit writings of John chapter 1 verse 1 and the writings of John chapter 1 verse 14. And before someone jumps and says, oh, but these guys didn't know Greek. These guys didn't know, uh, you know, the, the actual way to be able to read that. These guys lived closer to the apostles than any of us. And I think that's just stating the obvious. Leo also goes on to tell us to pay the debt of our sinful estate, our sinful state, a nature that was incapable of suffering was joined to one that could suffer. Thus in keeping with the healing that we needed, one and the same mediator between God and man, the man, Jesus Christ, was able to die in one nature and unable to die in the other. He who is true God was therefore born in the complete and perfect nature of a true man, whole in his own nature, whole in ours. Invisible in his own nature, he became visible in ours. Beyond our grasp, he chose to come within our grasp. Existing before time began, he began to exist at a moment in time. Profound words, indeed, by Leo in the end, uh, towards the end of the fourth century. 
So this was my, now again, I didn't manage to get all of this in, but this was kind of the angle that I was going for in my opening statement, mainly hoping that he would deal with the, Carlos will deal with the four premises and the conclusion. Uh, and boy, was I surprised when at the end of my opening statement, uh, I heard Carlos's opening statement and it was not Carlos speaking at all. It was a recording. It was a pre-recorded video that Carlos had prepared. And the, at this point, <laughs> the, the first thing that came into my mind is I've been scammed. Right? That's the first thing that actually came through my mind when I was, when I was listening to this because I'm thinking to myself, uh, now, I, I tend to prepare late for debates. Um, I, I typically struggle to prepare very early ahead. Those who know me know that about me. That's because I have a hectic speaking schedule. And so sometimes I'm only able to prepare two days ahead and, and at the earliest. And so, oh, at most a day before the debate itself. So I, I rely on a lot of the readings that I've done before and, and compile them. Uh, and have my notes ready and just and the last day before the debate, just compile them uh, into a proper argument, uh, try to go over them and to see whether there are any holes in the argument and so forth. And so I, I, Carlos had been asking me if I would be interested in exchanging my opening statements with him. And I, was, I shared with him that I was unable to do that. Uh, we did try to arrange that in the last debate, but I couldn't, get, couldn't prepare my, my debate in time to be able to do that. And so I actually said, you know what, let's just do it in a way we regularly do in debates, which is just to go up and present. And so I was with, in this frame of mind, surprised to see that Carlos had, after my opening statement, produced a recording, a pre-recorded opening statement. And the thing is, he didn't even announce that it was a pre-recorded opening statement. He just put it as if it was a real thing. And I caught it, the audio was clearly different and I called it out. Uh, in fact, I would... I'll let you have a um, take of this. This is from uh, our YouTube channel, our version of this. And the reason I say our version is because this particular section, if I am correct, has been removed from Carlos's uh, version of the debate. Uh, that is his channel. Now, I may be wrong about it because the latest one that I saw from his channel did not have this. Uh, it had been taken out of the debate. But uh, this is the the my response to the pre uh, to the to the pre-recorded opening statement. Left, and then I will be uh, back yeah. on once that time runs out. Yeah, I do have a question, uh, yes. Tracy. Uh, sure. Was that recorded just now? Was that Carlos's opening statement recorded? Carlos, yes. yes. I mean, Carlos, I mean, that's not fair, right? That's not professional at all, right? So that you can use your opening statement to work on your rebuttal already. You know, that's, that's just not, I mean, I hope that anyone watching this would realize that's not fair at all. So... Uh, yeah. So you can imagine that just going through the entire opening statement, realizing it was recorded, I, I could hardly focus on what was being said because in my mind, I was just thinking that, well, uh, Carlos would be using this period to prepare for his rebuttal and that's just not fair, you know. So uh, I voiced my objection and it, it was interesting to me that the response that the moderator gave, which by the way, uh, is part of Carlos's group. Uh, Tracy, who, who's, who I believe did an excellent job as a moderator, uh, but I would have to say her, her response here was, was a really re in, a bit interesting to say the least, and you can watch it right here. Uh, but I'm going to, uh, I was actually half tempted to even leave the debate at one point because I, that's just not, that's not the proper way to do things. We are supposed to do it. We both have a time to actually sit down and debate. We shouldn't be playing recordings of each other. Just want to put it out there. Uh, to the moderator and as well to Carlos. Okay, well, that's, I start. that's your you. opinion, and I respect that. Yeah. Hmm. Yep. All, All right. right. I think usually, um, if if anything's recorded, it's just to keep within the allotted time frame. I'm not sure that he thought of uh, taking that time to prepare for the rebuttal, but I I noted what you said, Samuel. So. Thank. Thanks for noting Thank that. All mm -hmm. right. Yep. So uh, I must say that. I found the explanation a bit strange, but Carlos did write to me later and apologize for it and said it was a miscommunication. So I've decided to give Carlos the benefit of the doubt. But uh, what I did notice about his opening statement is that all of it had to virtually do with the fact that uh, his main contention is that Jesus had a beginning. He would go to the Gospel of Matthew chapter 1, where it talks about the genealogy of Jesus and he would argue it's the genesis, the creation, the beginning of Jesus. 
and he would go to the Gospel of Luke and talk about the beginning of the Son of God and try to argue that Jesus had a beginning in the birth of Jesus, in, 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 in the beginning of the Gospels, which in a way is kind of strange because we, we don't deny that. And if you remember everything that I've discussed about the communicatio idiomatum, how the, the communication of the properties takes place, that the, both the divine nature and the human nature, the, the, the attributes or the properties of these two natures are communicated to the person, Jesus Christ, so that in the words of Tertullian, you can actually say that, well, God, God died, uh, God took on flesh. Both of those things are, um, are, are biblical things to say because that's what the scriptures teach. And it's, it's not like we denied that. So it, again, it appeared, it came across strange to me that Carlos's opening statement does that. And so in the cross-examination, one of the first things that I wanted to get at, because I had the chance to cross-examine him first, I wanted to ask him whether he recognized, now that he has heard, granted he prepared the entire opening statement without having heard my opening statement, but now that he's heard my opening statement, does he realize that everything he just said about the birth of Jesus as the origin of Jesus is a non-issue? Because the Bible teaches that and we account for that in the Communicatio Idiomatum. That was the question. You can check it out right here. Yeah, so I want to say that uh, you, you do realize, because I'm, I'm a little bit put back because I thought that this would be plain information. So... Uh, we do believe that the human nature of Christ had a beginning, right? I mean, you, we do we do concede that. We believe the human nature of Christ is a created nature that came into existence uh, through the virgin birth. Uh, and that you, you recognize that we believe that, right? I, yes, I recognize that the, the two natures of Christ or the hypostatic union is prefaced uh, on the idea, on the Chalcedonian idea, which came, by the way, more than 400 years after Christ, that uh, God the Son, the second person of the Trinity, uh, added or assumed or took on, I read different variations of that, uh, human nature. But the point of my opening, in case it was not clear, is that I'm relying on Matthew, who talks about the origin of jesus the messiah period not the origin oh, yes. of a human nature and i'm relying on luke's account that specifically uses sun language to talk about how the sun yes. comes into being so he 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 does not seem to realize that everything that we discussed about the communication idiom martin would actually dismantle his his objection uh, using the opening of Matthew's gospel and the Luke's, in Luke's gospel. So what I begin to realize here is that perhaps he does not understand the communicatio idiomatum because bear in mind, I don't think I had presented this in the debate yet because I simply didn't have time in that 10 minute opening to do so. So I'm going to straight up ask him to define the communicatio idiomatum and this is his response. Right. So Here's the thing. Uh, I mean, so you, you you would be would you would you help us explain your understanding of the communicatio idiomatum? No. Uh, do, do you, could you define what the communicatio idiomatum is? Uh, as far as I know, it's that something about the two natures do not mix or not together. But I can't. I think this was the. One of the major moments of that debate where he acknowledges and concedes that he does not he's unable to define the communicatio idiomatum and uh, you know he, he doesn't even seem to be able to properly define it so at this point i realize now i get the problem that he's having here he doesn't understand the communication of the attributes and because he doesn't understand how it works he's naturally as confused as to how you can say that Jesus, the person Jesus had a beginning and yet claim that Jesus is uncreated from the foundations of the world. How, how those two things work. So this way I get into a bit of a lecture mode here and I kind of try to get into what I did with you guys, which is um, go through the communication idiomatum with him. When you understand that, and 
when you understand that the both natures are communicated to the person, the one person of Jesus Christ, uh, do you not fail to understand why every single one of your objections actually just, just disappears? It doesn't affect it at all. Because we do believe that that's something not that came in Nicaea. That's something that Ignatius of Antioch, who is a disciple of the Apostle John, is saying. So I explained to him what the communicatio idiomatum is. And I begin to press on this question. And you, you'll see that I press him over and over again. Because to me, if you understand the communicatio idiomatum, you understand that the objections you just raised don't work at all. And so I would repeat it over and over again, and I would notice he would change the subject. I would bring him back again to it because that's what you do in a cross-examination. Someone was asking me why I was harsh. That's the goal of the cross-examination. You, you want to be able to keep your opponent on point because if they can't answer the question, they're going to dodge. And you can't just let that happen. I've got a limited amount of time to be able to help the viewers recognize that his position is, is in this case, an unbiblical one and one that he himself does not understand what he's objecting to. So he has a beginning and he does not have a beginning. He is uh, some... But, but uh, not to like... side... Sorry, sorry, Carlos, I'm going to... Because I think we're sidetracking here. Uh, the question that I asked, just to repeat that again, uh, is do you not see why this would... In, this is essentially what we believe and it doesn't even come to the Council of Nicaea. This is actually early Christology directly from the fathers that come from post-apostolic period. This is what they already teach. It's not me misunderstanding, uh, you know, what the translations are saying, not realizing the culture in Greek or Hebrew, uh, but rather this is just what the Christians have always believed. And even those who are acquainted with the apostles, you're right, it is unbiblical tradition, I mean, extra biblical tradition, but this is what we're saying. And my point is, whatever you said about God dying, God being immortal, whatever you said about God having a beginning, uh, or, or, or rather, Jesus having an origin, Ganao, uh, well, uh, the, 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 uh, the genealogy part in Genesis, in Matthew 1.1, 1, 1, all that is resolved. It's a non-issue, right? That's, I was just asking whether you, you recognize why it's a non-issue in light of I this. Think, I... So Carlos here is going to take the opportunity to say that I've made an overstatement about this is what the earliest Christians believe. Um, and again, he's, he's allowed to do that, but not during my cross-examination because that is a... Maybe a great answer, but it's a great question, a great answer to a question that was not asked. Uh, and the point in the cross examination is to answer the question being asked to you. And in, when I'm saying all this, I, I would love for you, those of you watching this to watch how I respond in the debate, um, which is not going to be in this review, of course, but go to when the period when Carlos gets to cross examine me, and you will see at the end of almost every time I'm questioned. I would ask Carlos, did I answer your question? And he acknowledges, yes, you did. In fact, there was one point in the debate, he says, yes, beautifully. Um, and so the reason for that is this, I want to make sure in the debate that I'm answering exactly what he's asking for. I'm not dodging, I'm not changing the topic. I want to deal exactly with the question that he's being raised. But unfortunately, Carlos is not doing that, uh, extending that same thing to me. So I'm having to press him, get back to topic. And here he's saying it's an overstatement. I'm saying you, you can respond to this in your own time, but you've got to come back to what I'm asking you. Do you see that if you take into account the communication idiomatum, your entire objection in the opening statement just disappears? And that, that was where it is. And you're going to see me asking him again this and not getting an answer in the process. You know, so you, I think you're overstating your case when you say this has been what we have always believed since we call ourselves Christians. Well, that's just historically inaccurate, but, and it's wrong. But, that's not but, the but case. But that's not my question. But that's not my question, no. Carlos. I would appreciate it for no, the third I'm, time. I'm, I'm trying to get to the same question. The, I'm responding to the overstatement of your generalized generalization of early maybe, Christianity. Maybe uh, again, Carlos. With all due respect, you can respond to that. Uh, if there's something you disagree with the way I overstated it, you have a rebuttal period to deal with that. Uh, I just because I've, I'm short on time, I just want to get you to to say that. Do you realize that everything you said is just resolved by the communication idiomatum? It's as simple as that. That's it's just a simple yes no question because I just well, want to ensure to help. I want to just I just one second. I just want to help our viewers who are listening to this realize that every single one of your objection 
just doesn't work because of a very simple thing that, and my point is not that, uh, I'm, I, I, if, you, if you want to argue that it's an overstatement, that's fine, you can do that in the rebuttal. My point is this, it is not something post-Nicaea, it's something we find in the earliest period of the apostolic times, and not to say that makes it true, I'm not saying that, all I'm saying is, something that we have from the earliest times, if just taken at what they mean, resolves what you brought up, do you or do you not realize that, is what I'm trying to get at. And you would see Carlos keeps going back to, this is what Matthew and Luke is saying, this is what Matthew and Luke is saying, and uh, essentially he's adding to what Matthew and Luke says. Matthew and Luke do not deny that Jesus had a pre-existence. In fact, I would argue they teach that Jesus had a pre-existence. And I could demonstrate that in a separate video. But the point is, he's not answering the question. And the question is, do you see how this will basically dismantle your entire op opening statement? He keeps saying, well, I, I can only say what Matthew and Luke, that, that's not the question asked. Uh, you know, so do you see it or you don't? And if he doesn't see it, he, this is a great opportunity for him to say, no, I do not see it because and go on to explain where it's different but you know there's a reason he can't do that because everything that i'm saying here um, that jesus was born is in line with what matthew and luke teaches so he obviously can't acknowledge that it's been answered and move on he's got to keep showing that i believe something or christians believe in something that is different from what matthew and luke teach even though we are echoing the exact same thing. Don't we believe that God was born? Don't we believe that Jesus Christ, the person of Christ was born? We do. So why is he pretending that we don't? And so this is a mischaracterization. It's a straw man approach. And despite my repeated attempts of trying to uh, engage with him here, he's not responding uh, straightforward. He's just dodging to Matthew. And, and you're gonna see this take place all throughout. But from here on, I take a different approach because I realized that this line of cross-examination is not going anywhere. And so I've switched to just getting him to acknowledge something that is least controversial. Do you acknowledge that Jesus had a human nature? Oh, just something that will get him to be, it's a yes, no question, which, which I, I thought would be simpler. And I don't get, again, as surprising as that may be to you, I, we don't get a straightforward answer. My point is this, the okay, let's just look at Tertullian, simple one statement. Tertullian says that the two natures of the substance displayed in him as man and God, him as one person, in one respect born, in the other unborn. Do we believe that the person of Jesus, the person, not human nature, not divine nature, the person, the second person of the Trinity, Jesus Christ was born. Do we believe that, Carlos, yes or no? I believe what Matthew and Luke believe, that he had a genesis. Uh, Carlos, I'm not, He's, Carlos, I'm no, sorry. No, I have to press you. Carlos, I'm me. so sorry. Carlos, well, can I'm so I sorry. Answer? You asked me a no, question. No, you're not. You're not. Okay. I, I've, asked, I've asked you a very simple, Carlos, I'm trying not, I'm not, I don't want to interrupt you at all, but I want you to answer my question. My question is, is do we believe that the person of Jesus, that is not the human nature, divine nature distinction, the person of Jesus, do we believe, does Tertullian believe that Jesus, the person, was born? Yes or no? Matthew talks about the beginning, the origin, not just the birth of Jesus, the Messiah, the Son of God. Right. That's what. Now, we're going to come to a very interesting part in the debate where Carlos is actually going to use my time, where I'm supposed to be asking him questions in my cross examination to ask me a question. And I thought it was really interesting what he says. So I'm asking, I'm gonna ask him to repeat what he says. And what he's going to tell me is that, you know, what you are saying is nonsensical. I think that's what he, he says, uh, which is strange because that's not an argument against it. It just means that he doesn't get it. And I quickly call him out on it. You said that you, you're interpreting Ignatius, passable mm -hmm. then impassable as someone who is born and unborn yes. i'm saying that's nonsensical can we agree on that uh i would say that you can ask me that during the cross-examination but i would just respond to that by saying just because you do not understand something does not make it wrong In and so at this point it, it when carlos says that it's nonsensical to me i am beginning to sense or figure out why it is it makes no sense to him 
it's there are two reasons for this number one he has a strong tradition that is that god cannot become a man remember the way we framed the debate the question is can god become man and so can god become take on flesh and since carlos's answer to that is no even though he doesn't explicitly stated in this debate um, he can't see past that wall that if god becomes man what's going to happen to him that's just an impossibility it is tradition that is blocking him from being able to adopt a straightforward understanding of the text it's right there it says the beginning was the word the word was with god the word was god in verse 14 john 1 verse 14 the word became flesh it's right there why can't he see it tradition has blinded him from it and at the end of the debate he's going to say well, if you take that line of reasoning you're committing blasphemy and i'm going to say yeah, that's exactly what jesus did <laughs> jesus oh, the, the charge brought against jesus was that if you go down that line of claim you've committed blasphemy so i'm saying something no different from what jesus is saying when i say that jesus is god the key here is recognizing that we must be able to take a straightforward understanding of the text and let that shape our understanding of Christ, not go to scripture with an preconceived notion of what it must be like because of our tradition and then try to fit the text into that. That's eisegesis, not exegesis. So at this point, uh, what I'm going to do is, Carlos has just said that, there, there, that he implies that there's no biblical basis for it. I'm going to throw him uh, Colossians chapter 2 verse 9 which is the key text that we looked at just now and let's see how he does with that bodily in him the one person Jesus all of deity that is all of the divine nature dwells bodily what does that mean it means that God was in Christ in 2nd Corinthians 5 verse 19 Paul says that God was reconciling the world to himself in Christ. All right. Now, the okay. Greek word. Yep. Please, no, sorry, please go on, Carlos. Please go on. Now, the Greek word there in Colossians 2 9 is a very specialized, if you will, technical word that Paul uses that is translated uh, invariably as the Godhead or God nature. So, but most translations simply have God. So, God was in Christ. You have Ephesians uh, 3. Uh, 19 as well. Uh, we're, uh, uh, Carlos, we, we're just talking about Colossians 2 9, Carlos. I've got a little bit of time. So, if you're wondering why I'm smiling like I just won the lottery, it's because Carlos Xavier just admitted that Colossians 2 9 teaches the God nature, the divine nature. And that means that he agrees if that is God nature, then the divine nature dwells in Christ, the person of Christ bodily and it's not just the divine nature it's the fullness of the divine nature omniscience omnipresence all of those things dwell perfectly in the person of jesus christ bodily which also implies the human nature so at this point i'm going to grill him because he's just conceded this is a defining moment in the debate he's just granted that that is talking about the divine nature the topic of the debate is are, does jesus have two natures to me i'm thinking this debate is over right here and so what i'm going to do for the rest of the debate is to grill him and my entire approach here is to just get him to concede first and foremost that there is a human nature that to grant something that 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 is it will seem to be quite basic which is my premise too human beings have a human nature and so i'm going to grill him to say that jesus has a human nature and then i'm going to push it further to say it talks about a divine nature so he does possess a divine nature and i'm going to build those two to conclude that therefore Jesus possesses both a human and divine nature. And the debate would have been over right there. But I, I wonder if Carlos figured that out. And so he's not going to answer the simple question. You're going to see him dodging over and over and over again. And what I'm going to do is I'm just going to call the moderator and say that, you know, you've got to intervene. He's not answering the most straightforward question. Here you go. And this is why I said earlier to those of, the, those of you watching, we're going, the difference between me and Carlos is this, I'm going to be able to just take this prima facie face value and tell you, I don't have to twist it in the name of context. I don't have to tell you it's ambiguous. I can just tell you, it says here, fullness of deity dwells bodily. And I want to get this now. I only got five minutes left, Carlos. Really quick, yes or no question. Do you agree that the phrase dwells bodily implies Jesus as a human nature? Yes or no? Again, I can only restate what I've said. 
uh, elsewhere in Ephesians 3.19, Paul says... Carlos, I'm asking you about... Feel, Carlos, uh, I'm asking you about Colossians, Carlos. You're going all over the place. I'm, I, need, I'm not, I don't want to interrupt you. I want you to deal with Colossians 2.9. I only have five minutes left. Yes, so I'm dealing that, with it with, with, with context that you don't like. No, but, uh, not, not uh, in the name of context. context. Just, Carlos, okay. it's a simple question. It's a yes-no question, all right? So in yes, Ephesians no. 3.19, Paul says... Carlos, it's a so yes-no question. Mean, Carlos, so it's a yes, no. Carlos, this, you see, this is, all the uh, I, I wish the moderator would step in at this point. Uh, <laughs> I just wish the moderator would step in because this is not correct. I'm asking you a okay, yes, no question. Okay, I will step no in question. here for a second. So, Carlos, he's asking about Colossians, but Samuel, he's trying to explain his point of view using scripture. And so... I guess we can either Under, stop at my, that my, point my, about Colossians or you guys decide how you want to uh, do it. My, my, so. my question is a yes, no question. Is this dealing with the, 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 the I mean, the, does Carlos agree that when it says dwells bodily, Jesus has a human nature? Does this Again, it, he, to me. I don't think for what it, he believes he can answer that in it, with that. Well, I'm trying to answer, okay. but I keep yeah. getting cut off. Did you catch what Tracy said? I do not think he can answer that question. And she's absolutely right. He can't answer that question. I think Carlos is smart enough to know where I'm headed with this and that my game plan is to get him to acknowledge the human nature and then just pick up on what he just said. It's divine nature right there. You've got the human nature, the divine nature. You put them both. Jesus possesses two natures. The debate would have been over right here. But Carlos will not answer that question. And um, he wriggled and went all around to get out of uh, that line of questioning. Uh, and again, in, in, a, in a way, despite not going the way that I had wanted it to go, a clean cut finish right there, uh, it, it, it was very obvious, let's just say, to the audience that he was unable, even to the moderator, the exact words of the moderator, he's not able to answer that question. And what I'm doing here is just helping you realize why that is. Uh, because if he goes down that line of reasoning, it's over right there. And so he has to frame this debate to say, well, it doesn't teach that Jesus has two natures. Well, not in those exact words, but it does teach that there is a person of Christ, which we all accept. It does teach that the fullness of deity that, according to Carlos, is the divine nature, dwells in him. That means he possesses the divine nature and it dwells, dwells in him bodily. He possesses a human nature. They have it. it, it it's right there. So... It's all about, when it comes to a debate like this, it's all about how you frame the question. And because from an exegetical standpoint, biblical interpretation and hermeneutics, you want to allow the text to speak to you. And that's exactly what we can do. We can allow the text to speak. But if you have that tradition that is blocking you, and on top of that tradition, you know, you have this uh, idea that God cannot become man. No matter how you approach this, you're not going to be able to allow the text to speak for itself, you're going to have to redefine everything. And that's a painstaking process. And so uh, right after this, what I'm going to do is, um, I, I'm, he's not going to deal with Colossians 2.9. Instead, he's going to try to do something really interesting, which is because he can't deal with Colossians 2.9, he's going to go and jump uh, to Ephesians. Um, and again, I, I think the only problem, I think one of the biggest problems that I had here is that in my remaining time of rebuttal, I didn't nail him on this point. I was prepared to do that. I just, for some reason, you know, in a debate, a lot of things are happening. Um, and sometimes you need that focus right there to just put the finishing touch in. And I think in this part, I failed uh, to do right there. So Carlos is gonna go and mention Colossians, uh, sorry, Ephesians 3.19 uh, as a basis for making sense of Colossians 2.9, which, Again, would have been perfect for me to sum this up. Here you go. I answered it at first, but you don't like the answer. I believe what <laughs> Paul is saying here is that God was in Christ, and he says it in a similar way in other passages. And if I may finish the verse I'm trying to finish, sure, Ephesians 3.19 is a good parallel for people to study in connection to Colossians 2.9, because in Ephesians 3, verse 19, Paul also says he wants us Christians to be filled to the measure of all the fullness of God, which is similar language that he uses here. It is, it is not similar language at all. So did you catch that? What he's saying is that you cannot, well, you're going to have to go to 
Ephesians 3 19 which says and to know the love of Christ that surpasses knowledge that you may be filled with all the fullness of God Carlos is going to take that to mean that we too can be filled with the fullness of God and so it's nothing unique about Jesus when it says in him the fullness of deity dwells bodily uh, that, that doesn't mean much uh, it doesn't make Jesus divine now here is where again as I said I should have called him out on this because see Colossians, uh, sorry, Ephesians, there, there are two problems with this. Let me go at this one by one. The first problem is this. If you cannot exegete directly from the text itself what a text means, you have to jump to a different letter to make sense of it. Now, there's nothing wrong doing that, but it demonstrates an exe exegetical incompetency on your part because guess what? The earliest readers of this letter, that means according to your approach, will not be able to understand directly what this means because they didn't have access to the other letter. So uh, even though Paul is writing to the Colossians, he says in him, the fullness of deity dwells in bodily form. Uh, well, they, they can't understand what that means. They've got to go around and wait another two centuries till, you know, the, the, the canon is, is firmed up and, you know, where they have access to what Paul wrote to the Ephesians. And only then uh, they can actually make sense of what it is. And until then, they just got to have to, you know, get their theologies all wrong. No, I, I believe that scripture is written clearly. And that means that Paul is guided by the Holy Spirit to be able to communicate with a degree of clarity what God wants us to know. And so if you just look at the text and look at it and read it in context, it's quite clear in what it's intending to communicate that the fullness of deity, which again, according to Carlos, is the divine nature, dwells bodily in the person of Christ. So he can't answer that. He's going to dodge and jump to Ephesians 3. Uh, 19 which is the second part of what I was going to say and that is this would cement our position even stronger had I taken the opportunity uh, to do that again I let I dropped the ball big time on this one and so the entirety of Colossians uh, 3 verse 14 to 19 is actually one sentence it's one long sentence it's a prayer by the Apostle Paul so let me read the entire prayer from verse 14 to 19 Paul says quote for this reason I bow my knee before the father comma from whom every family in heaven and on earth is named comma that according to the riches of his glory he may grant to you to be strengthened with power through his spirit in your inner being so that Christ may dwell in your hearts through faith that you being rooted and grounded in love may have strength to comprehend with all the saints what is the breadth and length and height and depth comma and to know the love of god and to know the love of christ sorry that surpasses knowledge comma that you may be filled with all the fullness of god full stop that was a pretty long sentence but you know why the Apostle Paul believes that each believer in Christ can be filled with the fullness of God? The reason is because according to verse 16, sorry, verse 17, Christ may dwell in your hearts. Because if Christ dwells in your heart, you have the fullness of God dwelling right with you. So even when he goes to Ephesians, to, to 3 verse 19 to try and distort the plain meaning of Colossians 2 19 if you just let that same sentence be read out it disproves his point and proves that the reason why the believer can attain the fullness of God is because Christ dwells in us because wherever Christ is he carries the fullness of God with him in him the fullness of deity dwells in bodily form such a powerful text of scripture again as i said I can, I'm, I'm regretting that i didn't take this opportunity to nail this point right there but hey thank god for youtube can do it right here but that was uh pretty much the end of the cross-examination uh period for me and now again i i would highly 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 encourage that you watch the entire debate and watch especially Carlos Xavier's cross-examination of me and as I said you're going to repeatedly see me asking him after every question did I answer your question and getting him to say yes you did because I didn't want to dodge uh, I felt that by the end of this cross-examination my cross-examination the debate was over it was gone by the grace of Jesus Christ uh, it was done 
uh, and dusted. And so when it came to my turn, you know, I was just happy to lean back and just uh, let Carlos, uh, you know, just ask his questions. And to be fair, I think Carlos's question um, in when he was cross-examining me what, what, what were amazingly what were good questions. Those are good questions to be asked. He asked about Grudem uh, and his Christology, um, which you know I, I didn't want to get into because that would be a uh, first of all, you know, Grudem's Wayne Grudem, the theologian, uh, and his Christology. There, there have been developments between the first edition of his systematic theology and his second. But uh, and I've also done a video on. Um, Wayne Grudem's Eternal Functional Subordination, which I guess you can find on our YouTube channel, Explain International. But I didn't want to get distracted with that because I felt at this point really, really comfortable. And so if you watch his cross-examination of me, uh, I was just thankful that, you know, with every opportunity I could get, uh, I could, could, but hopefully, by God's grace, give more clarity to this topic. So in conclusion, uh, when we got to the conclusion, I just went over my opening statement again, the four premises that I brought up. Premise number one, uh, you know, to let me let me read it again. So just uh, to make sure that I get it all right. Premise one, God possesses a divine nature. Premise two, humans possess a human nature. Premise three, Jesus is truly God. Premise four, Jesus is truly human. Therefore, Jesus possesses two natures. And there was none of these points that that were that, that faced serious objection that I had not already responded to in uh, both Carlos's and my cross-examination. So um, I felt this was a great debate. Uh, if you pardon some of the parts that I felt were, let's just say not so professional doing the recording beforehand and of course just dodging over and over again until he just refused to answer any single question. But apart from that, I, I really enjoyed this debate very much. Um, and a lot of it is due to uh, you know, Carlos's uh, temperament in debates, you know, and that's something that is really, really good. Uh, he, he is respectful. He is, uh, you know, he, he, he tries to engage by, by doing a lot of research. So when you debate Carlos, you're, you're dealing with someone who, who takes the time and the effort to want to understand your position. He was writing to me the night before to find out exactly which version uh, I would be using in terms of a Christological model. And um, so, uh, you know, when, when you deal with someone like that, you know you're going to have a really, really good interaction, even though in this case, I think that he he was unable to sustain his position, simply not because I was better than him, but the scripture is pretty clear that Jesus has two natures. And I'm, I'm thankful to God for the opportunity to have this debate with Carlos. My prayer, uh, Carlos, if you're watching this, as you know, uh, as I've written to you before, my prayer is that uh, you come to believe in Jesus Christ as your God and your Savior, and, and your Savior, just as He is both my God and my Savior, our Lord, our God. And to believe not just the Jesus of Biblical Unitarianism, which is a far, far cry, a departure from Biblical uh, Christology, from what the Scriptures teach Jesus truly is. Um, and to just embrace uh, what the Scriptures just in plain words teach, our God and Savior. Jesus Christ. Hope this video has been helpful to you to understand a little bit about the two natures. If you have more questions about the two natures of Christ, uh, do feel free to drop them in the comment section. We will be glad to take your questions and uh, there are going to be times where we can't answer all the questions directly, but we do have a team of apologists that we're developing here in Explain International and we develop them in two places. Uh, number one, we have an apprenticeship program where we develop uh, our apologists and number two, we have a Great Commission apologetics program uh, in partnership with Malaysia Baptist Theological Seminary. This is a fully accredited program. Uh, we, have, we, we run the program uh, together with Malaysia Baptist Theological Seminary, both physical in Kuala Lumpur, Klang Valley and online. So those of you who are in other parts of the world can sign up for this as well. Uh, this is run at certificate level, which is a one year program and also at diploma level and uh, Masters of Arts level, which is a two-year program 
And so if you're interested to find out more, do email us at explainapologetics at gmail.com. We'd love to send you more information about how you can sign up for that. And we will be starting our physical courses uh, in Klang Valley in Malaysia starting on January the 9th. And so if you are interested to sign up for that, uh, please do contact us with the email address that is available below uh, as I've just announced it. And uh, we'll be happy to uh, talk to you and our seminary coordinator will be more than happy uh, to explain to you how you can be a part of this program and equip yourself and your church to be able to defend and contend for the faith that was once and for all delivered unto the saints. Until next time, God bless.